Hey everyone, and welcome back to this class, the NumPy stack in Python. In this lecture, we are going to look at one of the two basic problems in supervised machine learning called classification. When we're doing classification, what we're trying to do is predict a category. This might sound complicated if you've never heard of this before, so I think it's best to do some examples. Now this one is a machine learning classic. In fact, for many years, this was the standard benchmark and whenever someone wrote a new paper, they would always report their algorithm's performance on this dataset. This is the MNIST dataset which you've seen in the exercises. The idea is you'll have an algorithm and it's going to learn how to take an image as input and as output, it's going to tell us what digit that image represents. The possible digits are zero through nine. Now, of course, you may realize that this is just a special case of handwriting recognition. A more general version of this classifier would be able to take in an image of any character and map that to the corresponding character. So, for example, instead of having just 0 to 9, you could also have A to Z. And, of course, an immediately useful application of this would be converting handwritten documents into digital form, which is a much more versatile data format than paper. In machine learning, what you'll often find is that there are two types of data that we're constantly working with. With MNIST, we're working with images. Images generally fall under the field of computer vision. It's called this because you're teaching a computer to be able to intelligently process images. The other common data format we work with in machine learning is text. Text is everywhere, just like images. In fact, you can think of the entire internet as just being made up of images and text. There's video too, but video is really just a string of images. So for all practical purposes, images and text make up a significant percentage of data on the internet. The internet is itself a set of documents consisting of images and text. When you're working with text, that generally falls under the field of natural language processing. And so it happens that these two fields, computer vision and NLP have been transformed by deep learning. Both computer vision and NLP algorithms have made significant strides in the recent past thanks to deep learning. Okay, so the point of the slide is just to remember that in machine learning, we have two sort of naturally occurring and very prevalent types of data, images and text, and their respective fields are computer vision and NLP. All right, so we've done one example for images, which was handwritten digit recognition. What's an example of classification for text? Well, this should be an easy one. How about spam detection? You might notice that these days, modern email providers like Gmail automatically sort your spam and non-spam email for you. So your junk mail automatically goes to a folder called spam, and your regular mail just goes to your inbox. Well, how is this done? Well, it's not magic, it's just machine learning. In particular, it's a machine learning algorithm that classifies emails as either spam or not spam. Now, of course, there must be some examples of classification that do not fall under images and text. Businesses these days are taking advantage of machine learning to improve their services and make more money. So can we think of an example of that? You bet. So I think one thing we can all relate to, whether you love it or hate it, is online advertising. This is those banners you see when you go to Google and Facebook and other websites. Online advertising is a billion dollar industry and it's the source of a lot of controversy. Luckily, this course isn't about the ethics of advertising. So here's an example of how an online advertiser could make use of a machine learning classifier. Suppose the advertiser has collected some data about you. For example, they know your age and your gender and your location. They know that yesterday you did a Google search for best sunglasses for running. Now what they can do is look at the list of possible banners they can show you and try to pick the best one based on which ad they think you will click on. So they'll go through the ads their clients have given them 
and they'll find one for running sunglasses, and they'll say, aha, I believe this person will click on this banner. And you'll end up seeing the banner that the advertiser chose for you. So this is an example of classification, because for each banner that they have, they can predict whether or not you're going to click on it. This is called binary classification because there are only two answers, either yes or no, meaning click or no click. Spam or not spam is also an example of binary classification. So what is the common theme of all these examples? It's that for each example, you have three things. You have your input data. This could be an image, some text from an email, or simply attributes about you as a person. This data is fed into a machine learning classifier. Finally, this machine learning classifier makes a prediction. So for our examples, that would be, what digit does this image represent? Is the email spam or not spam? Will this user click on the ad or not? So remember this picture and remember these three components. Your input data, this goes into the model, and the model takes the input data and makes a prediction. Now one question you might have at this point is, well, how does the machine learning classifier learn to make correct predictions. And this is where the learning in machine learning comes in. Normally, in machine learning, we have a table of data from which to learn. But not only do we have the input data, like the images or the text or the user attributes, but we also have the correct answer. Usually, people refer to these as labels or targets. In my courses, we usually use these two words interchangeably. And so the short answer for how a classifier learns to make correct predictions is it's given lots of examples of inputs and their true labels, and some algorithm learns to identify this pattern. Now at this point, you might think the lazy programmer is just being lazy and is trying to sidestep the question. He still hasn't told us what algorithm the classifier is using to learn. And in fact, this is what machine learning is all about. It's about these specific algorithms. So you're not going to learn about them today in this course because this course is just about the basics of machine learning. I have 20 courses so far on different machine learning algorithms, which equals to hundreds of hours of video. So if you think you're going to learn machine learning algorithms in a day, you are dreaming. You can spend years studying machine learning algorithms. But of course, the basics you learn in this course are a necessary prerequisite. Okay, so what am I trying to get at here? What we need, in fact, is a useful abstraction. Let's treat the machine learning algorithm like a black box. We can assume this black box is capable of doing two things. Number one, it can learn a pattern based on training data. Remember, this training data consists of two parts, the input and the corresponding targets. People usually just call these X and Y, respectively. Number two, after it learns the pattern from the training data, it can make predictions on new data. So for example, Gmail spam classifier has probably never seen the emails I got today ever before. So how can Gmail spam classifier take an email it has never seen and know whether it's spam or not spam? Well, the reason is due to number one. It has learned to correctly identify the patterns between spam and not spam. Now that we have a basic idea of how classification works and what steps we have to take, we can start looking at code. Luckily, the scikit-learn API has exactly the two functions we need to perform the two tasks we just talked about. Also keep in mind we're not starting from scratch here. We're also going to need to use what we learned about NumPy arrays. So let's first consider our data. Remember, we usually call these x and y. Our data x, generally speaking, can be thought of as an n by d matrix. n stands for the number of samples, and d stands for the number of dimensions. Let's imagine what this data might look like if we were doing spam classification. For simplicity's sake, let's suppose we're going to keep track of a few key terms, Nigerian prints, insurance, and loan. Perhaps we might keep track of other words as well. And so, in each cell in this matrix, there's going to be a 1 if that term appears in the email, and zero otherwise. So for example, in the first email here, we can see that the term Nigerian prince appears, 
and we can see that the corresponding label is spam. Notice that if x has n rows, then y also must have n rows. In fact, it's just a 1D array of length n. This is because for each input sample we have, we must have a corresponding target. All right, so hopefully this is pretty intuitive. Your training data consists of an input matrix x of shape n by d and your output vector y of length n. Okay, so back to the scikit-learn API. Suppose we pick a classifier. Let's pick the random forest classifier. I like this choice because it has classifier in its name, which makes it obvious it's a classifier. And it also happens to be quite a powerful classifier, which is nice. We'll talk about different classifiers and some of their pros and cons later in this section. Remember, the two things a classifier has to do are, number one, learn, and number two, make predictions. So the way to learn is very simple. We just call the instance method fit, and we pass in x and y. Making predictions is similarly very simple. We call the instance method predict, and we pass in some data x. Notice how predict does not have to take in any y argument. Why might that be? Well, when we're making predictions, we simply don't need to be told the right answer. That's because at this point, we've already learned the pattern from the training data. That's why we call fit before we call predict. One thing we're also going to want to do is evaluate our model. In other words, we want to be able to ask, after we've trained our model, how good is this model? Normally with classification, we're interested in classification rate, also known as the accuracy. These two terms will also be used interchangeably. So hopefully this is very intuitive. It's just the number of predictions you got correct divided by the total number of predictions you made. In scikit-learn, this is just another function called score. Of course, you can also try implementing the score function yourself as an exercise. You should be able to accomplish this just using the model's predict function.